shortcuts. This conference will now be recorded. You'll have a you'll have an additional reference there. Uh, so some of those things I'll show you will be things like uh, how to do a shortcut to get to the end conditions in SolidWorks uh, and how to kind of leverage the use of the right mouse button. And also on that site, if you ever want to do any practice challenges, um, you can take a 2D print and turn it into a 3D model and just kind of uh, challenge yourself to see how long it takes you and, and even if you can complete the challenge at all. So I think there's over 30 of those challenges on there. Uh, they're just, uh, you just take a 2D print and turn it into a 3D model. And a lot of times, even talking with Kirby, uh, he's he said, you know, a lot of times that's the best way you can learn from somebody is kind of watching them think through a challenge and watching them uh, kind of work through a challenge in the software. So I thought today that might be kind of a cool format for us to use for this tips and tricks presentation. So how does a solid expert go from a 2D print to a 3D model? And the first uh, drawing, the first 2D print I'm going to start with here is actually one that we used the other night in the live stream, which is this cone. So how do we go from a 2D print of this cone into a 3D model? And I'm just gonna go through and build this now. I'm gonna take this 2D print and I'm gonna move it over onto my other monitor. But if you want right now, you can take a screen grab of this uh, so that you know, like as I'm referencing dimensions and as I'm going through and I'm building this, uh, you'll, you'll kind of know what I'm referencing. I'll occasionally bring it back onto this monitor so I can talk through uh, kind of how I think through this challenge. But again, if you wanna just take a moment, use like window snipping tool or something and grab a screen capture of this, it might help you to kind of follow along while I'm clicking through SolidWorks. So a lot of times when I'm uh, faced with a challenge, any challenge, any 2D print, uh, when someone gives me a 2D print or when somebody gives me a napkin sketch or uh, if there's a physical model uh, that I'm gonna uh, retrofit something to, the very first thing that I do is I kind of think about what my game plan is gonna be for that challenge. I almost unbuild the model uh, in my head, thinking about how I would uh, approach this thing in SolidWorks. And so a model like this, you know, it's a, it's a revolved part. The first feature is probably gonna be a revolved feature. And we can see this section BB here up in the uh, upper corner. Um, and so you actually already kind of have the sketch for your first profile. So you can see that if I was just to kind of follow this perimeter here on the outside, uh, kind of come down, come up like that, and then draw a center line. That's probably what my first sketch is going to look like for this uh, for this model. Now, what I'm going to do at that point is I'm going to look around the model and I'm going to look to see. Okay, here's a 10 millimeter wall thickness. Um, lost my cursor there. Uh, here's a here's a 10 millimeter wall thickness. Um, Here's a 10 millimeter wall thickness. Here's a 10 millimeter wall thickness. So I'm gonna kind of look around the whole model and try to see if there's any areas where it's not uniform wall thickness. Uh, so it looks like uh, this is 10 millimeter wall here as well. It looks like pretty much everything throughout the model. It's all using that same kind of uniform 10 millimeter wall thickness. So that's good for me to know ahead of time. But again, it's just part of kind of coming up with that game plan so you don't run into any surprises. Uh, so, you know, I basically have an idea of what my first sketch is going to look like. Let me move this over to my second monitor here and I'll jump into SolidWorks and we'll take a look at what that first uh, model, that first uh, uh, feature might end up looking like. So I'm going to go new here and I'm going to go to a new sketch. And you'll notice here that this model uh, down in the, the title block, it tells me what the unit system is and it tells me what the material is. A lot of times when you work with the same vendors or when you work with the same department, you're only picking from maybe a handful, maybe 10 or, or maybe 15 different materials. A lot of times you can save some time just by making a template that's preloaded with that material, preloaded with some maybe custom properties that are gonna land in the drawing. So I always think it's good to remind people of you know the, the power of working with templates. And so you can see I've got some templates here. One of these templates is in ABS and MMGS. So you know right away I've saved myself a couple of steps by not having to go over and set my material or go up and set my metadata properties up top. So based on my game plan, I'm just going to start out on the front plane here, and I'm going to start out by creating some geometry. Uh, this geometry is going to uh, maybe come over like so, and then come down at an angle, uh, then come over like so. And then there is a dimension here that I can type in using auto dimension, so I'll just come up 20 there. I'll come over 10 here for a wall thickness. I won't be able to necessarily auto dimension this whole print, but I can at least kind of get close. Here you can see that I'm able to actually reference the parallel relationship to that other line. So that's another way that you can maybe save yourself some time. And then I'm going to close off this sketch. Now, 
when I was creating that sketch, I was using the, the click, 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 click method. So that means that when I close off that contour, the, the line command stops. And this is just kind of a little nuanced thing in SolidWorks. But when you do that, like click, 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 click method, you're, you're making a chain of lines by default. But if you just do the click and drag method, so if I just click and drag and then let go of my mouse, it just makes one single line and then you're you're out of the command or you're you're no longer in the chain of line commands and sometimes that's just good to know because that means you can immediately come over here and do things like add relationships or in this case i'm going to make that for construction right away and you know it's it's a little thing but it is something that i actually use quite a bit where i'll create a, a completely closed contour and then i'll create another line just so that i can quickly go over and make it for construction instead of uh having to jump into the center line command it's not like it's a huge time saver, but it is a little nuanced thing that I do. And, and sometimes these little things start to add up over time. So you can see here that uh, I'm gonna make that a value of 200. Uh, that was a control Z that I did there to back out of that when I messed up that command. Um, you can see here that I'm just basically gonna go through now and just add a couple of quick dimensions. Like here's the 10 millimeter wall thickness for that lower edge. Here's the 10 millimeter wall thickness for those two lines that are parallel. Uh, so by picking those up as parallel, it did save me a little bit of time. Here's the uh, 10 millimeter wall thickness up top. And then we get into our actual revolve dimensions. And in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick this uh, distance at the bottom here, this point here, and then I'm gonna single click on the center line. And when I cross over that center line, you can see that I get a doubled dimension. Now, again, a little bit of a nuanced thing about this doubled dimension is that if I revolve this feature here, so this is supposed to be 80, and then I'll do the same thing here with this one. This one is supposed to be uh, 180. And then I'll finish off here by specifying what the angle is uh, here between these two. But I'll, I'll come back into the sketch in just a moment to do that. If I go to the features revolve command here, you can see that what happens by default is that these linear doubled dimensions that I created by going across the center line end up automatically becoming diameter dimensions. So this is going to look great in a drawing. This is going to look great in a drawing. But again, a, a little nuance about this um, is that you know, what actually triggers that to happen is that I both revolved and dimensioned to the same center line. So if I do a control Z here for undo and I create a second center line, so I'm gonna create a center line here, or maybe let's say I don't even have that center line. Let's just say I go into, um, uh, let's say I have a center line over here like this, just I'm using it to, to locate some other geometry and I go to features revolve. Well, now I've got a scenario where I've got two center lines in the sketch. So SolidWorks doesn't know which one to rotate about. So I'm just gonna go here and I'm gonna say rotate about this line, you know, revolve about this line here and I'm gonna hit the green check mark. Well, now when I double click on that feature, these dimensions down at the bottom are no longer automatically converting to diameter dimensions. And the reason that that happens is because I didn't double dimension and revolve about the same line. And if you don't, if you don't also revolve about that same line, SolidWorks doesn't automatically turn them into diameter dimensions. So I don't know if you've ever run into that uh, before, but if you ever have, or if you ever do, now you kind of know why it happens. So again, the reason why is because when you go to do your, your features revolve command, you wanna make sure that the line that you're revolving about, and this is especially important when you have multiple collinear center lines, like if you had a collinear, or you had a center line down here, but then also had one up top for some reason, you wanna make sure that you both dimension and revolve about that same line. So once we do that, we can see, there we go. And again, as I'm going through this stuff, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to sing up. I'll, uh, I'll, I'm happy to stop and review or uh, dive in a little bit deeper on any of these, these topics. So you can see the sketch has a minus here. Um, that means it's underdefined. And of course, I think it's very important to fully define your sketches every time. So we'll come back in here. We'll do another one of these double dimensions. This time it'll be an angled dimension. Uh, so the angle on that thing is supposed to be 14. And you'll notice this angle is the, the total kind of open angle on this model is 14. So to get that dimension, instead of just crossing over the center line, what we have to do is we have to hold shift on our keyboard. So you hold the shift key here on your keyboard, and then you can see that that lets you actually get the doubled uh, angle dimension. So we'll make that 14 and then revolve it, which is already revolved. We just have to exit the sketch and we're good to go there. You'll notice that I decided to make that sketch closed off at the top. This is something that I do a lot is uh, I just like to keep my sketches really simple. So instead of including that additional dimension in that original sketch and then maybe having to create 
uh, additional relationships. I'll just close off that first sketch and then go back in, pick a sketch, you know, uh, begin a sketch, press the S key on my keyboard, go into the circle command, use the auto dimension functionality. So I'll make that 21 and then I'll just extrude cut that. So that was an S key jumped into the extrude cut command. And then I right mouse button and do through all and then right mouse button again. And I went through that kind of fast, but it was really just to illustrate that a lot of times it's easier to save those cut extrudes for a later feature. If you can just rip through a cut extrude that quickly, it might save you a lot of extra clicks in the sketch. So I really like to preach, you know, keep your sketches simple. And I'm gonna do more examples of that, uh, those right click end conditions as we go through some of these other examples. So I'm not gonna double back on that right now, but uh, the, the more important kind of underlying lesson is keep your sketches simple. Don't feel like you necessarily have to include everything in that first sketch. Maybe it makes more sense to close it off and then punch that hole through afterwards. So here what I'm going to do is I'm going to now add in these ribs. And so the, the rib command in SolidWorks is, is uh, often one that perplexes people. Uh, it looks like these ribs are shown here at a distance of two millimeters from the top uh, down to the rib. So two millimeters from that ledge down to the rib. So I'll just do that with uh, maybe with a new plane. So I'll pick this face and then I'll press the S key on my keyboard and go to reference geometry plane. And then I can uh, make that two and reverse direction so that it drops down there. And then I'm gonna pick this face, begin to sketch, orient my view and just drop in a line here. I mean, with rib, the cool thing about the rib command is that it basically does an up to next extrusion in three different directions. So it's gonna go up to next to this face it's also going to go up to next to this face, and it's going to go up to next to this face all in one single command. So I go here to features, rib, and you can see that when we go to rib here, we can say that's going to be um, five millimeters per the print. There's five millimeters, and that's it. I can just press enter again. There we go. Done. So it's kind of cool that it does that like up to next, up to next, and up to next all in one feature. And then I'm going to finish this off uh, by doing a pattern of six instances. And the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to pick the rib from the tree. Then I'm going to hold control on my keyboard and pick a circular edge of the model. And then I'm going to go up and launch the command. So now when I jump into circular command, you can see that SolidWorks pre-selected that circular edge and pre-selected that feature. And then all I need to do is just punch in the number of instances here, hit the green check mark, and I'm ready to move on. And you know, by comparison, if I hadn't pre-selected that, then what ends up happening? Well, when you go into circular pattern, now the feature tree is gone. So now you have to either pick the feature from the graphics area, or you have to go in here and find the feature. And a lot of times what I end up doing is I end up picking the edge because I'm like, I want to I want to pattern it about here, but then that's not the actual feature. See, so yeah, like I'm clicking here and nothing's happening. Like I'll click here. Oh wait, now I'll put that feature in the wrong box. And like, it's just a lot of uh, kind of futzing around, a lot of uh, misclicking and, and just a lot of extra time when if you learn that you can pre-select the feature and the circular edge and then jump right into that circular pattern, that's one that, you know, again, can just save you a lot of time. You're just ready to keep moving on with that design. So the last feature in this design is uh, just that final uh, set of four ribs. So you can kind of see these ribs if you look in from this end here. And uh, these are, Dimension a little bit interestingly, it's a 65 millimeter dimension across center to these bottom, uh, you know, corner points of the rib, uh, and then the rib is parallel to this existing wall and it just goes right up to the top. So you know, you could definitely do it with a rib feature, but another approach to this is you could go to your front plane, begin a sketch, orient your view, and then change your display here to hidden lines visible. And so when we change our display to hidden lines visible, what we could do is we could S key jump into the uh, line command and then just pick this point here and kind of come straight down on that line. So we're picking up that collinear relationship to the existing internal edge. And then just like we did before, we could, we could try to pick up that parallel relationship, see how it's showing up in yellow here. And then this is a trick that I do a lot of times is I just end up kind of dropping the final point out here in space. Because to me, it's easier to then take that point and just drag it like so. Like, I, I just think that's easier than maybe trying to come up here and maybe accidentally getting the midpoint and then you're stuck with that extra relationship. So instead, I just kind of dropped it out in space there. Then I just hit escape, grab this point, drag it onto there, and I'm good to go. And so now I just need to do my final couple of dimensions here, which is that, that weird double dimension across uh, to 65. And then finally, the dimension from this lower edge here to this edge, which is going to be at... Let's see here, 30 millimeters. And so we'll do a boss extrude now. And now because this is gonna be mid plane, 
you know, I can be confident that it's basically going to be touching off on tangency to that inside surface. So that overlap is going to merge, you know, exactly where I want it. So I'll make this uh, five at mid plane. And that finishes that rib. And now, you know, just kind of rinse and repeat what I showed before. Pick that rib, hold control, pick this edge here, go up into circular pattern. And now let's just bump this down to four. And so we hit the green check mark here. And that pretty much finishes that design. Let's take a look at our mass properties. And we can see that the mass properties of this is showing it at 719.98. And the print, the challenge was asking, you know, what is the mass of this part in XXX grams? And the correct answer is 718. So we did it, right? We got through it. We got through the challenge. So I know that that might've looked like we were just kind of going through one part, but really what we talked about in that section was we talked about, first of all, it's important to have a plan of attack uh, it's important to, you know, you can, you can save some time by working with templates. Uh, the double dimension we talked about, how when you cross over the center line, and you have to pick the line. If you pick the end point, that's a, that's a pretty common thing that I see people uh, misclicking on is if you go here to a center line, and then you go to create a dimension from that center line. So if I go to create a dimension here uh, to this point, see, I don't get that double dimension. But if I go to the center line itself and cross over, then I get that double dimension. So make sure you pick the line and not the uh, not the end point. And then we also talked about the idea of uh, rib, you know, just a little bit of rib, a little bit of exposure to the rib command, how it goes up to next, up to next, up to next. And we talked about how you can pre-select for the circular pattern. That could be a nice time saver. And we talked about how you can use show hidden edges in some spots when you want to get those interior faces and get them perfectly aligned. Um, and then, of course, it's always important to fully define your sketches. Kirby always likes it when I uh, remind people about the sketch song. So always important to fully define your sketches. So what do you think, Kirby? Is that a good start? Yes, like first five minutes, I learned something new. That little click and drag thing to not kind of like stop getting out of the the, the feature of the the little line feature. I've never known that. That's one that I use a lot. I mean, another spot that you can use that one in that can that can really be helpful is when you want to center something uh, above something else. So let's say, for example, I wanted to create something that was exactly centered relative to uh, this this angled face here. Uh, so what I would do maybe is I would create, uh, let's say I create a rectangle over here like so, and now I'm going to go to the center line command and I'm going to wake up the midpoint of this one and then drag over to the midpoint of this one. And then I'm going to let go of my mouse. And so I've only created that one line and now I can immediately come over here and make that horizontal. And now that will always be exactly horizontal to the midpoint of the cone. Like that's a spot where I use that a lot um, to just kind of keep things in line and just quickly you know, move something over so it's centered. It's good, good tips. I, I've learned so much, but just uh, I'll, it'll disappear on my head and I'll go back to my old ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's something that you can definitely, uh, I don't know. I, I would just chalk that up to just you being too smart. You got so much in your brain already that you just can't fit any more in, you know? Exactly. There's a question for you, Toby. Um, do I keep my sketches from tumbling around most of the time backwards when opening up a drawing or an assembly? Uh, I mean, w when you say tumbling around, um, uh, like, I guess maybe you mean like when you go to edit a sketch. Um, I mean, w one thing that you can definitely do with, with regards to that is, you know, when you do control eight, which is normal too, you can press control eight again. Uh, so you could be normal to looking at it from the front or normal to looking at it from the, the other side. So that can maybe help you in those spots. I'm not exactly sure I understand the question. So if that's not exactly what you're going for, Kent, just uh, uh, maybe elaborate and we'll try to figure it out. All right, cool. Should we do another one? Yeah, first. All right, cool. Let's do another one. Teach us more. 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 Okay, yeah. So this is another one. Um, I mean, these these challenges, you know, like like I mentioned before, I do have a, a tips and tricks channel. Um, you're welcome to, to head over to this channel at any point. And you can take these challenges. They're down here. They're called Model Monday Replay. Uh, I tried to pick ones for today that that I haven't done. Uh, you know, haven't haven't done on on the or haven't done a solution for yet. Uh, there's another playlist in here called uh, Model Monday Solved, where I actually kind of do the same thing like we're doing here, where I go through and, and kind of explain how I think through some of these challenges. But the models that I picked for today's presentation, I haven't posted in this playlist yet. So you're getting like kind of a special 
sneak peek a little bit. Uh, and some of them won't even, you know, won't even make it into this playlist. So this is really like exclusive content that Kirby's hosting here for everybody today. Uh, but uh, but if you if you want to see some of the different tips and tricks that I'm talking about, there's another playlist in there called Power Moves, and uh, that's where we talk about things uh, like uh, how to auto dimension. You know, when you're when you're working in a sketch and you want to get in there and create some fast dimensions, there's this auto dimension in sketch mode, and I talk about how you can enable that and kind of what you should be doing with your hand and what you should be doing with your mouse or um, some of the right mouse button end condition stuff, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about today. Uh, there's some tips and tricks on that too. So, you know, like I said, if you wanna get a little more practice, there's some practice models in there. If you wanna get a little bit more tips and tricks, there's some tips and tricks in there. Um, this is just something that, you know, like I said at the beginning, just something that I wanted to put together because I knew there were a lot of people that were maybe finding themselves at home with a little bit more time on SolidWorks. And so uh, hopefully it's helped out some of those people along the way. With that all being said, let's let's take a look at this next challenge here, this next model. So this one's called Anchor Base. So just like last time, if you want, you could uh, take a screenshot of this. And just like last time, we want to start out with kind of a game plan. Like, how are we going to approach this thing? I mean, the the first thing that you want to always ask yourself is what is your starting plane and what is your starting profile? So in other words, what's your first sketch going to look like and where is it going to exist? And I think on a model like this, it's pretty much a slam dunk we would just create a simple rectangle uh, on the top plane and that simple rectangle on the top plane is going to uh, be our footprint our uh, three inch by four inch footprint so this one's actually using inches instead of millimeters sorry johnny i know that you love uh, metric uh, but we're actually deviating a little bit here and we're going to do some millimeters or some inch stuff today uh, so, you know, I think that's probably what our game plan would look like. And so, you know, first thing we would do is create a rectangle here. I would probably create it centered on the origin and I would probably create it with sharp corners. Uh, again, just in that spirit of trying to keep things simple, uh, always trying to keep my sketches simple and just kind of keep moving forward and building several robust features rather than creating one uh, super, you know, super complicated feature. So if you want to take a screenshot of this, feel free. Uh, if that'll help you to follow along with the, the next part portion of the presentation. But uh, let's get into it here. And then, you know, obviously the challenging part of this design is going to be locating and creating this, this kind of com compound angled plane for this tombstone shape. So we can see that the tombstone um, is it's kind of uniquely defined here where I'm defining this 75 degrees in the isometric view or in the you know non-orthogonal view here. Um, so it's going up to two inches to the center of that tombstone. Um, it's, you know, the, the hole is centered on that tombstone. Uh, so the, the radius of the tombstone there is 1.25. The overall width of the tombstone is 2.5. And, um, you know, to get this angle, to get the location of this, it's kind of a weird dimension, this dimension, this one inch midpoint dimension. So one inch midpoint here, and then this uh this angle that we're looking at here this this uh, model here that we're looking at you know the angle isn't even really called out in order to to determine what this angle is from here to here we're kind of defining where this point is and then we are defining where these two points are here so this point and this point you know 2.375 1.125 this is the kind of stuff that you'll often get from somebody who hands you a napkin sketch. Uh, usually you wouldn't see this in an engineering drawing, but a lot of times if somebody just hands you a napkin sketch, this is the kind of crap that they'll pull. And they'll be like, yeah, just figure it out. You know, it's no problem. Um, and this is what you have to do. You know, if you're going to 3D print something for somebody, if you're going to build a fixture for somebody, this is sometimes just what you have to do. You have to learn how to do this kind of stuff. So what I'll do in these spots is I'll, I'll try to um, uh, maybe create sketch layout geometry to help me figure out you know, where that weird geometry exists. So let's get in here, let's do this. So we'll, this one is in aluminum alloy and it's IPS. So here we go, 1060 aluminum alloy and IPS. I'll go top plane, begin a sketch, orient my view, and then start out uh, by, and, and what I'm doing there, by the way, I know I'm kind of ripping through that fast, um, but what I'm doing is I'm just going over here to the tree, clicking on the top plane. Um, I'm kind of being careful not to accidentally go into a rename command. Uh, one little trick that my, my good friend, Joe Galliero once taught me was, if you click on the icon and not the text, you'll never go into the rename command. And again, it's these little kind of nuanced tricks that can really end up saving you a lot of time and frustration. But you notice here, if top plane is already selected and I click top plane, Windows puts me into a rename. But if top plane is already selected and I click on the icon, you know, I don't end up going into a rename. 
So it's just kind of a little shortcut that you can you can try to remember. It, you, you may find that it saves you from, you know, a couple of spots it'll save you in. And then I also, just personally, I don't usually have the dynamic references turned on. So if I write mouse button at the top of the tree, I don't have those references turned on that generate all those arrows. Um, I just think that that kind of helps me uh, both with renaming and with just general selection so I don't end up with those arrows. But that's that's really a little bit more of a personal preference than a, than a best practice. So then what I'm doing is I'm clicking on the plane that I want to sketch on, and then I'm just going up to this little icon here. So instead of instead of picking the plane and then having to go up to my toolbar and you know find the correct toolbar for sketching, I'm just picking on the plane and then clicking this little icon here. And then SolidWorks auto orients the view on your very first sketch. Um, after that, if you want to, there's an option you can turn on to always orient the view normal to, uh, but I don't use that because a lot of times I just, I like sketching at an angle. Um, kind of lets me see a little bit more what I'm trying to do. Then I'm pressing the S key on my keyboard, one of my favorite shortcuts, a huge power move time saver. The S key is uh, is clutch, as Sean O'Neill would say. Uh, I love the S key. And so I'm gonna go into the S key here and then I'm gonna go to center rectangle, single click, move my mouse away. Then I'm gonna let go of my mouse and go over to my 10 key and I'm gonna type in three, enter, four, enter. And then I'm gonna press S again and I'm gonna jump right into the extrude command and then I'm going to go to a height of 0.5. So again, letting go of my mouse, 0.5, enter, enter. And these are, you know, very common steps when you're doing your first couple of features. This is a lot of times what you're doing. You're creating the base plate. You know, future features are going to be uh, more uh, uh, nuanced. But your first couple of features, a lot of times this is it. This is all you're doing. So now I'm ready to create uh, the, that... Um, that tombstone shape or the layout for that tombstone shape. But interestingly, the location of that layout is actually based on these holes here. So we've got these holes here and then this one inch uh, midpoint to give us the layout for that tombstone shape is relative to those holes. So maybe I should make those holes first or at least a layout for those holes. Uh, so that's what I'll end up actually doing next. So I'm gonna pick this face and I'm gonna go to features hole wizard. And if you're working, you know, you're going to have to learn what your team does as far as uh, what the common size holds are that they use, common size hardware. And it can be beneficial to save those common sizes to a favorite. But another thing that you can do to, to help uh, uh, remain versatile is you can use this option down here that says show custom sizing. And then whatever your team is calling out, you can just kind of punch those sizes right in here to the, these fields. Um, so even though it's calling for a one half inch, uh, you know, one half inch heavy hex bolt, by doing the custom sizing here, I can kind of change it to be whatever I want. So in the case of this print, it's calling for a 0.2 through hole. I'm gonna press tab on my keyboard uh, with a 0.5 counter bore at a depth of 0.125. So it just, you know, even though it's saying it's one half inch, I'm just kind of saying, I don't care what the size is that's listed here. I'm just gonna put in my own numbers. I'm gonna make sure that there's nothing selected down at the bottom so I don't get like a near side countersink or anything. Now I'm ready to start dropping in these positions. And this is another spot uh, where you can sometimes uh, save yourself some time just by taking advantage of things like mirror and symmetry. Um, uh, it, it depends on you know what you know about the model. Uh, you can also, at this point, you can press the S key and draw a rectangle and you can just kind of drop in a rectangle like so and then put on some dimensions on that rectangle. So I could say this is gonna be 0.5 from that side and this is two inches across. Again, this is just based on that print. Um, and then this is, 0.5 from this side. You know, I don't want to necessarily assume that it is symmetric um, if the dimensions are being given to me from an edge. You know, maybe that edge is key. But then I could jump back into the point command, and now wherever I put a point, that's where I'm going to get my hole wizard holes. So this is something else that you can do uh, to kind of save yourself having to do a lot of horizontal vertical relationships when you're doing hole wizard. Of course, there's more than one way to do it. You could always go in and uh, and you could add your um, uh, mirror relationships, symmetric relationships. So there's a lot of different ways you could do it, but that's a trick that I use a lot is that I'll just draw in solid geometry because whole wizard only cares about sketch points. If it's not a sketch point, it doesn't care. So, you know, in this, in this sketch here where I'm laying things out, I could draw, you know, a bunch of lines. Whole wizard doesn't care about these at all. Um, I could draw circles here. Whole wizard doesn't care about these. I could draw a sketch point and whole wizard does care about that. And so that's the only spot where I'm going to get an additional hole wizard hole. So just keep that in mind if you if you ever need to create layout geometry, you know, bolt circles, things like that. Um, you know, don't hesitate. You can use like a hex. I've used hex commands before to do, uh, you know, equally spaced uh, six instances equally spaced. I'll just drop in a hex uh, hexagon in the sketch.
All right, so now that we've got those holes there, let's go to this top surface and begin a sketch, orient the view. And then again, similar to what I did in the tree, let me just get out of that sketch for a second. I'm just picking the face and then going up here to sketch. So again, instead of having to go up to the, this is these are spots where I see people kind of uh, spending a lot of extra time. Uh, instead of having to pick this face and then go up here to sketch and then click the sketch command, I just pick this face and then just go right here, sketch. All out of the box stuff, you know, ready to go, waiting for you. And so now I'm going to drop in this line uh, and kind of just try to get it close to what I want. Um, I'll say that I want this to be at a, a linear distance here of 2.5 inches across. And then I'll say that I want there to be a point here at the middle of this thing. And I'll make that uh, just, you know, just a midpoint relationship to that point. And now there's a distance again. This is this is really defined strangely. Uh, there's a distance from this edge of the model to that corner and this edge of the model to that corner. Um, and then a distance horizontal to the midpoint. Very unusual way of dimensioning it, but um, sometimes, like I said, you get napkin sketches that look like this. Somebody's got a, a, a genius idea that's gonna sell a million dollars worth of product, and they just need this to be 3D printed real quick before the end of the day. Okay, so 1.125, and then we'll say here, this is gonna be from this hole to that midpoint is a dimension of one inch, very strange. So now that gives us the location for that tombstone shape. And, and a lot of times um, that'll be it for that sketch. A lot of times I'll rename this sketch something like layout for tombstone. And then what I'll do is a lot of times I'll right mouse button and go to sketch color and I'll change the color of that. Uh, make it something that'll really kind of pop out and make it a little easier for me to see. You know, when the model's gray, I want to be able to easily see that. And now I can uh, go to, a, you know, a, a plane command, for example. So I could uh, pick this face here and then press the S key on my keyboard and go to uh, reference geometry plane. And then what I can do is I can say, I want that to be a plane uh, parallel to that face that I selected. Now I don't have to click anything. SolidWorks knows what you're trying to do, um, but it's parallel to that face that I selected. And then I just picked this layout sketch line that I created. Um, so now it is perpendicular to that face that I selected and it's uh, uh, coincident to that line, that second line that I selected. So here's coincident, here's perpendicular. So instead I want that to be the angle that's called out on the print. And then that angle is 75. Do a flip offset there. There we go. And now it's, you know, now it's just a matter of um, picking that face, begin a sketch, orient my view. Um, here's a spot where it oriented the wrong way, right? <laughs> so, um, so in these spots, what you can do is you can hold alt. Uh, maybe this is gonna get to, uh, uh, the question that came in earlier, so I could I could do the Alt key and then I can press the arrows left and right. That lets you do a, a barrel roll. Like if you ever played Star Fox, this is like uh, when uh, the Toad was telling you to do a barrel roll. And so then what you can do is you can, uh, in this case, I'm gonna go to the line command and I'm just gonna make a line that goes from here to here, right? That's the width of my tombstone. So I already did the layout. So that gives me that distance. Then I'm gonna come up uh, and I can use my auto dimension to make that two inches. And then I can take my mouse away. So I'm doing the click, click, click method. And now without clicking anything, I'm just going to move my mouse, my cursor back over that end point. So I'm going to move my cursor over this end point and then move away again. And now you can see it's a tangent arc. So I never had to switch commands out of the line command. So when I single click over here on this side, I'm back in the line command. And then I'll just close that off. And you can see here that the beauty of this is that that's now a fully defined sketch. I just did that in one pass and it's already a fully defined sketch by using my layout geometry, by using my auto dimension, by having this become tangent, tangent. You know, I didn't have to add any relationships. I'm just ready to move on. And so now I would S key extrude. And uh, this is going to be a, a distance of, let's see what the width of this, 0.375. And then I would, uh, a lot of times I do right mouse button here to change my end condition. So I'm going to change this to reverse direction. And the reason I do that is because I know that as soon as I do this, the mouse is going to change to also have a little right click on it, which means if I now right click, it's the same as hitting the green check mark. So I'm going to control Z there and just do that again. S key extrude, uh, you know, let go of my mouse, type in the value 0.375, press enter once. Now I'm going to move my mouse just a little bit, right mouse button, reverse direction, right mouse button again. I'm ready to move on to the next feature. And so the next feature is going to be this face, begin a sketch, S key, circle, wake up the center point. So I hold my mouse over the arc of the tombstone, single click that center point, move my mouse away, let go of my mouse, type in the value one, enter, move my mouse away, S key, extrude cut, right mouse button, through all, right mouse button again immediately, 
that finishes the command. And, and you notice a lot of those commands, I never had to go over and, and touch the property manager, just kind of really staying focused on the screen and, and trying to, I'm almost thinking about what the next command is going to be while I'm finishing the current command, um, because the software, you know, is predictable in that fashion. If you just, if you just kind of learn how it's going to react. So, um, so now, now I've got a couple of things that are shown out here. I'm just going to click on the plane and then click the little eyeball to hide it. Click on the line. You know, I think what's really thematic about these tutorials is that I really try to do as much as I can out in the graphics area. Um, and, and I try to rely on the, the tree as much. Of course, as soon as I say that, I end up hiding the wrong thing. So let me try it again. So click on the, uh, there we go, and hide that. All right. And then the final thing I'm going to do here is S key fill it. And with this fillet command, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, type in a value here of uh, radius 0.375, enter, and then I'm going to single click this edge here, and then I'm going to move my mouse up to these little previews. And what these previews are telling me is whatever's in magenta is going to get filleted. It's going to get selected for that fillet. So um, in this case, I'm just going to pick this first one. It gets all four corners. And then again, I'm going to right mouse button, which is the same as hitting the green check mark to kind of finish that command. And so at that point, I can go here to evaluate mass properties, and I can see that the uh, the mass of this thing is showing up at 0 0.80. Um, it's looking for it in three decimal places. So let me go to options here and, and bump this out. Okay, so 0 0.805 as the mass of this part. And let's see, there we go. We got it right again. Amazing. Amazing how we got it right again. So, you know, lots of things to learn there. I mean, remember, the plan of attack is really, I think, one of the most important elements of the design process. Think about, in the beginning, kind of think about how you're going to approach it. Look for any tricky features. Uh, think about, you know, what you're going to have to do with those tricky features, because you might be able to, to uh, change the order in which you build things to get those tricky features to be a little bit more easy. Like we had to create those counter bores first before we were able to do that uh, inclined plane. So think about your plan of attack. Uh, if you can use templates to save some time, that's always good. Uh, using a layout sketch and maybe changing the color of that layout sketch can often be very helpful, a great time saver. Even if you don't use that sketch for an actual feature, it can still be a great time saver. And then uh, the end condition shortcuts, I mentioned that uh, as I was going through, and, and I do have uh, these, uh, these, these videos that go into more detail on it, like you can right mouse button to end the command uh, instead of going up and hitting the green check mark. And also, uh, when you do a cut extrude, being able to do a right mouse button and choose through all, those are, those are things you can use all the time to really save a lot of time. Um, we talked a little bit about, about how the whole wizard works. And uh, as always, you want to always remember to fully define your sketches. Very important, uh, always fully define your sketches. And, and one of the things I didn't uh, mention there in either of those, but uh, down at the bottom here, the S key. Um, in this video, I talk about like how the S key works, how I set up my S key, uh, how you, you can see there how I'm able just to use it all the time. And most of what I'm using is out of the box. Like I don't do a lot of configurating. Uh, within SOLIDWORKS. I try to use it as out of the box as I can. So most of this stuff is already there. It's just a couple of little minor tweaks that I make. Like um, when I'm in sketch mode, I've added the uh, the menu for extrude. Or the, when I'm in sketch mode, I didn't I unmerge the line and the center line command. So normally this menu looks like this menu up here where line and center line are together. So I just kind of unmerge them and made them explicit. And kind of the same thing with the rectangle. So I have the uh, regular rectangle and then the center point rectangle unmerged. And then I added uh, boss extrude and cut extrude. That's that's basically all I did. Uh, but if you want to learn more about how I set that up, you can check out that video too. I think that's pretty much it for my time, Kirby. Um, I want to, you know, as a as a uh, kind of set of action items here, I would just say number one, remember to register for 3D Experience World. I know I didn't talk about it a lot, but uh, I think it's so important that uh, everybody who who's here, everybody who has a chance to register for it, uh, to at least take a look at the catalog. I mean, you can see the catalog uh, without even registering. You can actually see the entire catalog of sessions. So at least take a look at the catalog, but it's free this year. And if you can attend any of the sessions or even watch the recordings, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Um, make sure that if you do register that you go through and you build your agenda. And, um, and if you wanna see more videos, check out youtube.com slash too tall Toby. That's where I have all my videos. And at that point, I'll open it up to questions and, and hope that I've left enough time for our other guests. Sure. Um, Toby, Peter left your question. Um, any reason why, any reason you wouldn't save time by simply offsetting initial sketch form by 10 millimeter? to provide common wall thickness. I think that's with the cone. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. That that you could have done it that way as well. Yep, that's a great great suggestion. Um, and also maybe even just revolving it as a thin feature and incorporating that ten millimeters into uh, into that thin feature. I think that um, the biggest uh, uh, challenge, if you will, that I look out for with stuff like that is when you you have a change in the direction of the offset. I get a little bit. Um, I get a little bit uh, uh, cautious or I get a little bit aware. So like it's bending in here and then it's coming down and then it's bending out. It's almost like a inverse polarity uh, scenario with, with like a spline. And whenever that happens, I, I always feel like offsetting entities tends to get a little confusing, um, but that's just me, you know, and that's just, a, that's just a personal uh, opinion. So like, if, for example, um, you know, if the dimension is called out to, to the inside wall versus the outside wall, sometimes you then have to go in and create a lot of extra construction geometry. That would be probably the only, you know, justification of doing it the way I did it. Otherwise, I agree with Peter, you could save some time uh, just by doing one line and then either revolving it as a thin feature or taking that one line and offsetting it and capping the end. So I think that's a great suggestion from Peter. I, I see Ryan just posted uh, in the chat uh, the links to 3D Experience World. So if you want to check it out, there's the links. Toby, are you presenting at World? Yes, yes, I am, Kirby. Uh, are you? <laughs> so, no, <laughs> I, I, I've got plans, but um, I'll, I'll be around lurking. Okay, cool. Um, so if, yes. if, if you want to hear more of Toby, you yes, can I'm doing see a, him a I'm doing a tips and tricks on on SolidWorks, uh, kind of similar format to what I did here today, um, uh, but different different models, different tips, different tricks. Um, and then I'm also doing uh, using SolidWorks and doing data management in the cloud using 3D Experience. So if you have a team that's spread out geographically, uh, maybe an easier way to manage your files than uh, than using PDM and having to set up uh, like a VPN or some other type of virtualized solution. Uh, instead, you could host all your files in 3D Experience. So you're still working on SolidWorks desktop, but all your revision management and file sharing is facilitated through 3D Experience. Pretty cool solution. I got to say, I really like it. Uh, so uh, if you want to check that out, that's something that maybe is helpful. Definitely check out that session too. Cool. So is, is anybody have any questions uh, for Toby uh, while he's still about? Uh, check his channel out. It's a lot of awesome stuff I learned. A lot from it and he has his tournaments which are always fun if nobody <laughs> asks anything i have an off-topic question for toby maybe he can help me sure uh toby you know there is an uh, option in our some features propagate visual properties yep like in circular pattern and something else but this option is not included in move copy bodies comment the propagate okay. visual properties. Can you open the move copy move copy bodies common? Sure. Yes. We don't have propagate visual properties in move copy bodies. I opened a claim in SolidWorks uh, some forum or website for like eight or nine years ago, and nobody is demanding this common for this move uh, propagate visual properties. I am having in every part 50, 60 times linear pattern move copy back to the original position to keep the colors oh to keep the colors wow Base okay. colors. yeah so what happens what happens instead when you do move copy body to face colors go back to the normal part color for example can you recolor one of the faces of yeah. this body only one or two of them yeah yeah only the faces yeah Okay. Try to make a copy of this body in the same position. It's not possible to make keep the color of this face because there is no option here. In the same position? In the same position, just okay. a copy. It's not possible. Check okay. the new body. It has it's not it's colorless. Hide the original one, you yep. see? Yep. So I am using the uh, <laughs> you would think that it would just carry code. right through, right? Yeah, you would I think am moving it was... 100 millimeter, 200 millimeter with the linear function, and yeah. then I'm moving back it again with the move copy bodies function. What's the workaround just to do it in? Uh, uh... I am working in multi body uh, technique. Yeah. I have lots I of say... polygon surface bodies in my designs, and sometimes I need to uh, make copies or make scales because I'm working in foundry industry. Right. And I. 
I always need to keep the original file without scale. And I need to transfer the surface colors because there is a meaning of color in my design. Green means something, orange means some other thing. I have a design right. scholar. So you're just do so now you're doing this and then moving it back because you can't pattern it at zero. Yeah. But just type <laughs> oh, two yeah. and move yeah. it back. Yeah, and then you gotta move it back. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's a, if it's an SPR, you know, it's gonna get addressed. Um I wish I could I wish I could tell you that I had the clout to just say, fix this today. <laughs> and I could just so come down. Maybe you know someone. But maybe Who I knows? know someone, yeah. Yeah. I'll make a note of it uh and see if I can, you know, see if I can put Thank any heat so on much. it. But yeah, I mean, the best thing you can do, yeah, is just keep, you know, keep reporting it. Um, you know, if you, if you, that's really all you can do. Keep reporting it, share it with other people, get them to report it. Um, the more bumps that it gets, the more hits that it gets in the enhancement request forum, uh, the more attention it'll get from dev, from development. Like a glitch, you know, as you are telling in your tips, uh, copy surface, offset surface and change the uh, dimension to zero, it becomes copy surface. Right. That's actually yeah, intentional. There's no comment. Yeah, that's intentional because it used to be two explicit commands and they just merged it into one. Yeah. Cool. Great question. Great discussion. If anybody else has anything, uh, happy to happy to answer or discuss any other questions you guys have. Yeah, I think uh, we'll switch to uh, Melissa then, uh, and Melissa and Greg for their presentation. Thank you very much, Toby. All right, my pleasure. Sure. Thank you. I hope a lot of people learn stuff. Thanks, Toby. Let me switch you to presenter. Great, thank you. All right, can everyone hear us okay, yeah? Yep. Yeah, so, so um, yep. good, good. Good evening, everyone. I'm Melissa. And I'm Greg. And we're two of the directors at Tech Women, a UK based engineering consultancy company specialising in design engineering for the physical security of critical national infrastructure. Um, before we start, I'd like to say thanks to Kirby for inviting us to present at the meetup, um, just so you can bit, uh, find out a bit more about us and a bit more about Tech Women. Um, before we start going into the presentation, we wanted to ask everyone a quick question. So in some shape or form, we're all linked to SOLIDWORKS, whether it be a job or a hobby. But did you imagine that this would be your career pathway when you were younger? So our question is, what did you want to be when you were younger? If anyone wants to answer. For me, it was a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> when I was very young, I didn't know what I wanted to be. I didn't find out until later, almost by accident. Mm. Yeah, the, education, the education system at my time was pretty crap at dealing with anything in the creative area, particularly if you ended up being pushed into grammar school and they didn't have any idea about design technology or anything else that might have happened in an old fashioned secondary modern or now a comprehensive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. yeah. So a lot um, of people ended up on the wrong track and if they didn't have the will to do anything about it, they stayed there, I guess. Whereas if you caused a, riot, a ruckus or people got fed up with you, you ended up getting pushed into something and just finding out by accident and that's what you really wanted to do in the first place. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's it really, yeah. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. Like, when I was growing up, like, like, I wanted to be a footballer. Uh, so we both grew up not knowing what design engineering was until we were a bit older. Um, so if we had exposure to this at a younger age, we'd mm -hmm. feel that the decision to become design engineers would have been made much sooner. Um, and for me, I was, sorry, go on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, I actually ended up getting into a sixth form um, yeah. and being pushed into the uh, humanities or arts thing, which was quite restricted because they didn't even have geography as an A-level subject in that school. It was too small yeah. to support the teacher. So mm -hmm. I ended up doing sort of history or Latin or uh, English or something like that and I stuck it stood it for a year and then I told my parents that I didn't want to stay on any longer and I looked for a job and I found out the only thing I found out in the end after going to a number of interviews for apprenticeships which my father wanted me to look at was um, a, a trainee lab assistant with BP's research center mm. and I ended up in that for a few years until uh, 
there was one point where I, I took some time to settle in because once I got there, they put me in analytical and I thought it was suitable for sort of trained chimpanzees, to be honest. It was repetitious work, <laughs> really boring. And I obviously, obviously, they my body language caught on with the administrators. And all of a sudden, I found myself being offered another post. And it turned out that some, some other trainee didn't like where they'd been put and they wanted to get out. And so they thought they'd slip me into the job instead. And yeah. quite by accident, I ended up in a place called Basic Research. Okay. And I fell, on, I fell on my feet there and mm -hmm. quite enjoyed it. And then the administration, because it was all run, BP was like a civil service at the time, 52% yeah. owned by the government. So the administrators ran everything, even in a technical center like that. And one day I got a call saying, uh, because my uh, I'd been successful there and I'd been promoted, there was no space for me anymore there. So they were going to move me somewhere else and they'd be giving me some uh, appointments for interviews. And I ended up being re-interviewed by Analytical, would you believe? And they spent <laughs> two they spent two hours trying to persuade me that this was my only career move and I really had to come. <laughs> And I told them to piss off. And um, and then I complained to my section heads and various people who were really fed up with me being moved in the first place. And they went to their senior common room for lunch and asked if anyone had been um, uh, trying to get uh, staff. Um, and they said, yes, we're always trying. We've got a permanent thing on all these various other departments. And he said, well, we've got someone who can't find a job because they say it's the only job available in analytical. And so I think they stirred up a hornet's nest because all of a sudden I was given other interviews and I ended up in chemists uh, in the organic chemistry lab instead. But I didn't like it very much there. And, and I thought, what will I do? And I thought, well, how about all those things they told me I couldn't do when I was at grammar school? And that was to go back to an art school or something. So I went to an art school and once that I was booked into one of those uh, someone mentioned to my parents when they found out they said, oh I suppose he's going to do industrial design is he and so my parents told me and I said what the hell's industrial design and when he came round next I asked and he said well you know all that stuff you do in the garage rebuilding a car and messing around making fittings for your boat and things like that that's industrial design and then you know my eyes stayed out on stalks ever since yeah, yeah. So, so, so you know, the, the time it took to work that out and then find your path in life was, yeah. uh, you know, quite a number of years, really. And of course, um, although I was behind my peers at that stage in terms of sort of income and everything else, what it gave me was, you know, I went, I ended up going to industrial design and college and all the rest of it. Um, yeah. But my life had been half in the sciences and half in the arts. So I found myself in a very unusual position. And some yeah. people tried to employ me for that very reason. Yeah, no, it's, it, thank you very much for sharing your story, Peter. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear other people's stories as well. Yeah, and for me, really, I can, I can kind of mirror what you were saying. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And really the lack of any role model for me to look up to made it really hard for me to decide what to do, especially in engineering. Um, um, having this in mind is part of the reason why we founded Tech Women. Yeah, so before we start by giving a brief background on how we both got into engineering. So during school, my favourite subjects were science, art and maths. Um, I was really practical, but I stayed away from the more hands-on subjects like engineering and more towards separate sciences, really. It naturally made me think that medicine would be a good career to consider, but being practical-minded, I struggled to be certain of this until I'd experienced it firsthand. So I was very lucky to complete a range of work experience placements so that I could have a sneak peek into different industries and roles. Um, and this was invaluable really because it made me realise that engineering was a subject for me to pursue and I started doing you know, aeronautical engineering at the University of Salford. I managed to secure an industrial placement here at a mechanical engineering company specialising in designing security products. And here is where I found my passion as a design engineer. And it was here that I started using SolidWorks as well. So I achieved a first class degree. I knew that the next step in my career was to complete a master's and to specialise in a subject that I was interested in. 
I managed to secure what's called a knowledge transfer partnership, that's KTP for short, which allowed me to manage a two year funded project, gain personal development, like becoming an incorporated engineer, and complete a master's all at the same time. So my KTP focused on security products, specifically to improve the design process for security products, because normally 95% of them fail their first time physical tests. And we'll show you a bit about the physical test later. But um, at the end of the project, I was able to make the physical testing design procedure 40% more cost effective and quicker by creating and implementing modern prototyping and research tools, which can be used to predict future testing. On the completion of my KTP and my masters, I was looking for a way to still do engineering projects as well as promote women in engineering and STEM, which is what I'm really passionate about. I've made it my mission to be a female leader in engineering, to be the role model I never had when I was at the start of my career. And that's why we set up Tech Women. Yeah, so my path into engineering is a bit different to Mel's. Um, it's a career I didn't consider all the way through school. So I didn't have a specific career that I wanted to pursue or I didn't know the next steps after I completed my A-levels. So I've always been quite practical and I felt I needed work experience before studying the degree at university. So I went out and I found a technical draftsman's role at a local mechanical engineering company. Um, and this came with an apprenticeship programme, which allowed me to work and study at the same time. So the apprenticeship gave me the opportunity to gain real life work experience and as well as that, I gained a HNC, a foundation degree and a degree in mechanical technology. Um, so after completing the apprenticeship, I was promoted to design engineer in the R&D team. Um, here I was in charge of designing new products for the company and this is where I started to use SolidWorks. Um, I was able to design and test all the new products for the company. Um, this meant I was involved from the initial design to the finished product including the manufacture, the prototyping, and all the testing procedures as well. Um, after that, I progressed to the company's lead, uh, lead design engineer. Um, this came with extra responsibility. Um, so as the main contact for all the design work on specialist products um, and projects within the department, uh, this included security solutions for nuclear power plants as well. Um, and today I'm the technical director at Techwoman. Um, my focus is on solid work solutions and security design. So who are we and what do we do? So we're an engineering consultancy specialising in design engineering for the physical security of critical national infrastructure. Um, within the team, we have a combined experience of, of over 27 years within certified security solutions, IT and project management. Our company's mission is to empower women into engineering, to help achieve gender parity in the industry and to promote STEM careers to the next generation. Yeah, so we'll talk a bit more about the STEM promotion later in the presentation. Um, first, we wanted to go through some of the engineering services we offer as a business. Um, as you can see on the slide, there's a range of different services. It includes CAD drafting, SOLIDWORKS solutions and simulation, um, security design, project management, STEM activity days, STEM promotion. And last, we've got CPD advice and mentoring as well. Being design engineers, one of the engineering services we offer is CAD drafting. Um, this is primarily such like 2D AutoCAD, it includes things like manufacturing packs, as-built drawings, 2D drawings, and then converting paper drawings to CAD drawings. Um, the next thing, as we have SOLIDWORKS user group meeting, the next service we focused on is SOLIDWORKS solutions. So both of us are certified professional users and are proud to be members of the SOLIDWORKS Champions programme. I know we've got a few SOLIDWORKS Champions here tonight as well. Um, and yeah, the services we offer include sheet metal and fabrication design, complete drawing packs, 2D to 3D conversions, um, and we've got design for driveworks as well. In addition to this, we also provide project management and have run projects involving companies such as Airbus, Pepsi, the co-op and Daimler. Um, this we got like a brief video of an access cover we recently designed here for a client. Um, so this was finished ready from integrating into their driveworks system as well, so they can automate the design process. Um, so it's configured to allow the right support steel work, the right number of hinges, the right support bracing on the underside of the cover as well. So we really enjoy the design engineering job role and always look to showcase this and the software that we use to the next generation during our STEM activity days in primary and secondary schools. So with our background and experience in the security industry, the main engineering service we offer as a company is the security design. 
So this can be broken down into two sections. So first is the design of the security products, such as the ones shown on the pictures at the top of the screen. So these are physical security products protecting assets such as water treatment works and power plants, nuclear power plants and electrical equipment. We help with the design process from initial sketches, the creation of 3D models, FEA analysis, the physical testing process and the creation of manufacturing drawing packs following a successful test programme. So the second part of the service is the, like the assessment of sites and recommendations on how to improve its security. So we'll assess the site, see where it may be susceptible to a security breach, and then we recommend the correct physical security products with the correct security rating and certification to suit. So this includes sourcing the products and designing new products where they're not available already. So yeah, one of the, the leading certification bodies within the UK and other parts of the world as well is the Loss Prevention Certification Board, shortened to LPCB. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so to gain a certificate with, the LPCB, with LPCB, your product has to pass one of their physical test regimes. So here you select the delay time required from the product from one minute all the way up to 20 and the tool category A all the way up to H. So category A being the lowest level of tools is tools such as screwdrivers and sticky tape, whereas category H is still saws and gas cutting equipment. Yeah, so with the, with the test process, LPCB take the product along with the drawing pack as well. Um, and then they set to work with the tools they have available to them, um, try and break into the, the product within the time limit. So on the right hand side of the screen, are videos from a couple of different LPCB test programs. So the top right is a hammer attack, and this is a category B3. Um, and then the bottom right is D10, and this is a, a sledgehammer attack, and they're trying to break the fixings holding the product to the floor. So this is a tough process, and LPCB state that 95% of products tested for the first time fail. And through our security design advice, we aim to help companies looking to branch out into the security market by designing a suitable product to pass these tests using our first-hand experience with LPCB and other government test regimes. So now that we've covered some of our main engineering services, we wanted to give you an insight into our mission as a company and our give back to the next generation. Yeah, so first we'd uh, like to ask you another question. So looking at the images on the screen, can anyone tell us what these inventions have in common? Any guesses or not? We can just tell you the answer. <laughs> I am not too sure. I'm not very good at these games. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to spoil it either, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think someone's in the comments has it. Um, good guess, but no, not so. Can, oh, yeah. Yeah. So all of the images show items which are invented by females. So such as the windscreen wiper was invented by Mary Anderson in 1903. And then we got first computer program by Ada Lovelace in 1842. So we feel it, it's crucial for different genders to work together during the design process to create the best product possible. Um, another example of this would be the airbag, which was first designed by an all male team. When it was tested on women, they were hurt because only men were thought off during the design process. Um, to showcase the achievements of females in STEM, we have a female role model page on our website. Yeah, so on this page we detail women who've had an impact on the STEM industries um, and just show what women have accomplished. This includes people such as Katherine Johnson, whose calculations were critical to the success of the first and subsequent manned space flights. So we want the younger generation to be aware of these role models throughout history, as well as the current role models, such as the recent appointment of Kamala Harris as US Vice President. So she was the first female and the first black and South Asian American Vice President, and it's such an inspiration from young girls all around the world. Yeah, so like we mentioned earlier, promoting women into engineering is one of our missions as a company. So only 13% of engineers in the UK are female. And we really do need to do more to improve gender equality in all of these STEM industries. Yeah, so what do we do at Tech Woman to try and change this? So we write and feature in blogs, raising awareness of STEM and diversity. 
we participate in campaigns, these things such as BAME, diversity and women in STEM. We also offer mentoring services to females considering a career in STEM. Um, all the members of the team are STEM ambassadors and we act as role models as well. And last but not least, we deliver STEM activity days. Um, so there's a demand for engineers in the UK, which isn't currently being met. It's estimated that we need to be at least doubling the number of engineering apprenticeships and graduates each year just to keep up with demand. And promoting this as a career for everyone at grassroots level will hopefully encourage more people to pursue this. Yeah, so here are a few companies um, and institutions as well we've collaborated with so far, just to make our voices heard worldwide. These collaborations allow us to connect and network with others who are passionate about engineering, STEM promotion and women in engineering. And this next slide just shows um, it's a selection of articles and blogs we featured in as a company. So these are mainly focused on promoting STEM and women in engineering as well. So a few of my personal highlights include being part of the One Million Women in STEM and writing articles for Avanti and the Female Lead to celebrate International Women in Engineering Day 2019 and 20. Um, Tech Woman has recently been shortlisted for Engineering Ambassador of the Year Award by the British Engineering Excellence Award, which we're very excited yeah, about. Yeah, really excited, yeah. Um, and we put all this on our social media as well, so mm -hmm. yeah, check out social media, give it a follow, and you can keep up to date with what we're doing. So at Tech Women, we deliver STEM activity days to primary schools across the UK to promote STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths at grassroots level. Yeah, so it's been shown that young people's awareness of STEM increases by 90% following STEM events. And approximately 400 repetitions are required to create a new synapse in the brain, unless it's done with play, in which case it takes between 10 to 20. So this shows how important it is for children to learn through play and is how we base our STEM activity days. So um, there's evidence to show that children lose interest in STEM subjects as they get older. So with girls, if you look at 10 to 11 years old, they're at 72% interest, but it goes all the way down to 19% at the age of 18. Yeah, and with boys from the, the same age ranges, it goes from 75% all the way down to 32%. Um, so the, the demographic we look for with our STEM activity days is it's usually primary school age. Children who wouldn't get the chance to attend a, a STEM event normally. Um, and then the other thing we look for is parents that are interested in new ways to engage their children. Yeah, so through um, participation in the activity days, we aim to show children the variety of roles within STEM industries um, and get them interested from a young age. Yeah, so these are bespoke activity days which provide pupils with the opportunity to meet our STEM ambassadors who have a variety of different roles in STEM industries. They're from different backgrounds and they're of different genders. Yes, the activities are they, uh, activity days are designed to provide opportunities for the pupils so they can understand the STEM concepts. Um, most importantly, they've got to have fun as well. Mm -hmm. So we believe the best way to promote STEM is by using real life STEM role models from the industry. So the pupils can speak to our ambassadors and hear about different job roles and realise that you don't have to look or behave a certain way to embark on a particular career. Um, each day is a fun, each activity day is a fun STEM focus. It spans over our complete school day, um, includes all the materials required, provides a certificate of participation for every child and also includes a trophy for each of the winning teams. Yeah, so, so far we've delivered activity days to over 1,300 pupils across the UK. Um, for us, this is just the start. So at the moment we hold these in the UK, but we're looking in, into ways which we can provide this for other countries. We want to make it global. So we have our own STEM ambassadors who, take, who we take on to help us to deliver the activity days. Yeah, so the, the Tech Women STEM Ambassador Programme is designed to train people from the STEM industry. So they have the chance to give back by being role models, allowing them to share their career pathways and knowledge. So we have more than 50 ambassadors and we're extremely proud to say that over 70% of them are female. So um, typically STEM ambassador positions are voluntary. However, we as a company like to reward our STEM ambassadors. So becoming an ambassador comes with the following benefits. So um, a rewarding role with the opportunity to give back to the next generation. Uh, there's lots of networking opportunities within the team of ambassadors. We've got a, 
a very diverse range of people. Mm -hmm. um, mentoring from the Tech Women team in terms of employability, careers advice and CV development. And also we've got, you get a daily rate, um, you've got travel, accommodation and food expenses are covered as well. So the activity days take a lot of organising, but hearing girls announce that they want to be an engineer just like me at the end of an activity day and seeing how much fun the pupils have had fills me with pride. Um, looking back at my time in school, I wish that I had these opportunities. Maybe then my decision to choose engineering would have been made much sooner. Yeah, and we're always looking for new STEM ambassadors. So if anyone is interested, please let either of us know and then we can talk you through the next steps. So to allow us to deliver activity days within schools who don't have funding or are not part of an opportunity area, we require sponsors. Yeah, so on the slide, we've detailed the sponsorship packages. Um, this ranges from bronze all the way up to platinum. So our sponsorship packages vary in cost and complexity, but are always planned and delivered by us and our team. So the type of sponsorship package allows you as a company to choose how much involvement and media coverage you would like from the event. Yeah, so every package gives you the chance to choose a local school. Um, so bronze, say bronze, it's an activity day for for two classes um, and this goes all the way up to platinum so this is a, a stem competition for 10 local uh, 10 local schools um, you get full social media coverage a blog article about it um, and then you get input on the the actual activity that's the competition is based around so as well as providing opportunities to be a tech woman stem ambassador we also like to support those looking to pursue a career in engineering yeah so in the current climate we know how challenging it is to find a job and um, make yourself stand out from the crowd. So as well as helping with people's CVs, we also advise on appropriate courses, accreditations, just to help get you started on your chosen career. We also have a partnership with Up Education to guide students wanting to study abroad at six universities and 13 colleges throughout New Zealand and Australia. Yeah, so our involvement in this means that we give guidance on the appropriate courses, we support students through the enrolment process, the visa process, as well as throughout their, their studies um, and their stay in New Zealand or Australia. Um, and then the final thing is career guidance following the completion of their degree as well. So um, thank you all for listening today. Yeah, so if, if anyone's got any questions, we put our emails, email addresses at the bottom of the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, and we'll be here staying around till the end of the meetup. So, yeah, feel free, ask away. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. That's always a, it's the second time I watch that presentation. It's always really interesting to watch the fact that you do security stuff, mm -hmm. but you also do education. It's kind of, you wouldn't see those two together quite often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. It's, it's good that we get to be involved in both things. So, yeah, we've got the security and obviously the design side and then yeah, the activity day is really fun. Yeah, we really enjoy doing that. Yeah, and we you have mentioned friends. you use drive. We need to get in somewhere. <laughs> Go for it. I, I, I mean, we have friends if you want to get in somewhere. Sorry, what was that? So I think I just think saw in the, on the chat that Johnny said that he was, he was meant to email us. Um, pop your email address over to us and we can start, yeah, yeah. start chatting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was, I was going to say that um, you, you said you use DriveWorks as well to help your stuff. Yeah, so we're mainly um, setting people's, like, people have done models in SolidWorks, it's helping them set them up so they're ready to then implement into a DriveWorks system. Um, that's more of our involvement. I have set up driveworks at a previous company um, but we don't really get involved in that as much nowadays yeah i was gonna say because bridie and heather are in here and they're both from driveworks mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. both girls as well yes <laughs> unfortunately i don't have the uh technical skills but i'm heather and i are always working on them i think probably <laughs> so <laughs> i was i was actually no, I... gonna say oh i'm sorry did I step on you, Kirby? I, I was just going to say, I know DriveWorks has a certification program too, if you want to get those. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
if I could just for a minute at the start, first, Melissa and Greg, thank you so much for everything that you're doing to promote STEM in the UK. I mean, I know the same efforts are happening over here. And mm -hmm. also congratulations on being part of the 1 million women in STEM. I was part of that campaign last year too. And it was just so empowering to see yeah. people from all different walks of life. And for me, when you first started your presentation, talking about what did you want to be when you, you know, what did you want to be in your life? And I came from a small town in New York and I wanted to save the world. You know, I wanted to jump on a boat with Greenpeace and I wanted to go save the environment. And there's not a lot of women in environmental health, but I went down that path for a while. And I actually got my specialty in wastewater treatment because in theory, clean wastewater feeds our aquifer and it, you know, helps to save us all with clean water. Talk about not having a lot of women involved. That was around 1995, 1996-ish. And that was before I got involved in design engineering. And so just seeing the progression of women in engineering over the course of, I just aged myself to everyone on this meeting right now, but just seeing the, um, the progression of women in engineering and the efforts and people talking about it, you know, like let's get more young women involved. We're really actively involved here in yeah. um, first first robotics, which is robotics, you know, building robots at the mm -hmm. um, high school level. And yeah. but there's a big effort to get young women involved because it doesn't all have to be um, try to remove the barrier. It doesn't all have to be design. It could be on strategy. It can be on product development. You know, it can be in so many different areas. And so um, anything we all can do. Um, to, to kind of progress that. So thank you both. I just wanted to share where I had come from um, as far as a female starting in engineering over 20 years ago, well, longer than 20 years ago, but <laughs> uh, but uh, so good work. Thanks thanks again for being here. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for sharing your story as well. It was really nice to hear. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the SolidWorks space, though, whenever I come up against a company that uses SolidWorks to design wastewater treatment equipment, and I just get a little excited. Now, you, all you engineers know when you see something made with SolidWorks that you recognize. And so when I can speak the language, here I am five foot one on our DriveWorks booth, and I start talking about <laughs> wastewater treatment plant operations. Nobody expects that from me. <laughs> and so, but it's it's when the old world and my new world kind of combine that makes it a little bit fun. But that's what binds us, you know, is those relationships. So anyway, yeah. I'll stop talking. Sorry. <laughs> so if, if anyone has any other questions for Melissa, um, crack away on a Toby sets great presentation. Um, it is a good presentation. Yeah. Um, I'm sure like a lot of other user group leaders would love to show your presentation. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone wants wants us to jump on, yeah, we're more than happy. Yeah, and hopefully it'll help you reach more around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what we want to do, yeah. As many people as possible. Yeah, we're getting a lot of support from Sean through the SolidWorks Champions program as well, so yeah, Sean's short, short yeah. a legend. No, <laughs> you guys are the legends. But um, no, I mean, you know, for those of you who don't know that what the Champions program is, we, we created it uh, actually last year, um, you know, because we, we've had, you know, the user group networks for, for forever, right? And it's it's still alive. It's still thriving. It's still kind of true to its its mission, right, to, to get people together to, to learn about, you know, SolidWorks and share SolidWorks stories. But you know, we have people like Kirby. Not everyone is like Kirby in the way, um, you know, where Kirby's a user group leader, but also, you know, an awesome maker and content creator. And we have people that might not be leading user groups, but maybe, you know, like Heather said, like they're leading a first robotics team, right? So we have all these these different people that are doing these cool things or like, you know, Mel and Greg, right? That, you know, not leading user groups, but maybe they present a lot of user groups and they're doing awesome stuff like, like with Tech Woman. And, you know, we found that to kind of try to have SolidWorks evolve to meet, you know, where the user base is today and all the great stuff that people do, um, that we should make a new program to sort of, you know, um, bring that together, build, build a community from that. So, um, like Kirby, you were saying, like, I, I've seen this presentation mostly before, um, and it's always great to, to hear from you guys. I did notice, though, that you seem to have gotten rid of the 
uh, the video that's like looping of like, I thought it was Greg at first, is like hammering against a, a window <laughs> as part of like your security testing example. I was disappointed in that. I wanted to see more like, bang, bang. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, all serious is no. I mean, again, like just awesome to hear your, your story. Um, Okay. I actually had a bit of a, a a bit of a thing to to mention just while I'm here, Kirby. If you're cool with it, um, go for it. Go for it. And yeah, just like a nice little little perk thing. Um, so would you mind actually just making me presenter if you're cool with sure. it? Surprise presentation. <laughs> yeah, it, I I swear it'll be like two seconds. So, um, I know it's it's nighttime for a lot of you as well. So, and I promise you, you'll I well I hope at least you'll find it cool. Um, so this is, uh, this is not why I came here, but I figured while I was here, you know, I came here to, to see, you know, see Kirby as always to hear from, from Mel and Greg, you know, to, to hear Toby present. I always love, you know, hearing Toby present. Um, but while, while I'm here, um, you know, Toby mentioned, and we've mentioned a couple of times that the 3d experience world is coming up. Um, and I know a lot of you, if not all of you here who are listening to me talk right now, um, have, have registered. And if you don't know, it's, it's a free event this year. It's free. It's fully virtual. Um, you know, basically it's just your way to, you know, sign up for something that guarantees, you know, kind of the latest like product release news. And, um, you know, for, for a lot of us, you know, the coolest things are always the breakout sessions, the breakout technical sessions that, you know, we have over like 100 of them this year. Um, so definitely, if you haven't done so, just, you know, feel free to head over to 3D experience, 3D experience rail.com and register. But, um, I also wanted to mention, you know, it's kind of, it was a bit of a bummer, right? It, it, it's, it, you know, in, in ways that we, that we can't meet in person, you know, I love to kind of get together, you know, especially with, you know, people from, from areas where I'm not from, right? So I'm, I'm from, you know, my little pocket of the, of the United States. And, you know, for me, it was, it was a great time to see people like Kirby, Johnny, a bunch of you others. And, um, you know, that's a bit of a bummer, but even, you know, some of the cool things about world was like, you know, the bit of swag or like the little commemorative memorabilia that you get. And like, for me, world was always kicked off with like, just going to the registration desk, getting my stuff, getting my bag, you know, feeling like I'm, I'm kind of settled in after I get off the flight, you know, to wherever. Right. Um, and then getting ready to go to like, you know, this networking thing there or here. Um, so I wanted to give a bit of a taste of that. You know, we have, you know, potentially tens of thousands of people like, you know, watching this event. So it, it's not possible to do this for everyone, but we have kind of a flash, like, you know, sort of community VIP thing that we're doing here where we designed like a special edition commemorative badge. Uh, for a physical badge, like one you can hold, right? Like just like, just like any year for this event. Um, so what you're looking at here is like the front, the back, and then basically a packet of ribbons that you can request either today or tomorrow. And, and really the deadline's just as you guys would guess, just that, you know, basically shipping needs time to, to try to get it out to you. Um, but it's really simple. And I wanted to kind of thank you guys for coming to, to the user group, but also to, to give you guys a chance to request this stuff if you want to, right? If you don't want to, that's cool. But, but if you, if you really like the feeling, like Johnny was saying, like getting that, you know, that, that sort of that badge to make you feel like you're at an actual event, then this at least kind of, you know, supplements some of that. Um, so essentially you would get the badge, you know, it'll have a lanyard just like every year. It'll have this packet of ribbons. Um, you know, there's a billion goofy fun, you know, ribbons that people make, um, but we kind of stuck to like maybe a core five year. Um, and essentially you just go to the link and you just kind of give some information about where you'd like it, like to be shipped to. And, you know, as long as you do it, I would say in the next day or two, um, I would think it should be there for the first day of the event. And a lot of people like, you know, me too, like I, I keep, um, you know, we'll keep our ribbons, we'll keep our badges, right? Um, and, you know, for a lot of people that goes back 10, 15, 20 years of just going the world. And, you know, that idea of like having something missing for everyone, although, you know, we can't do it for everyone, but, you know, for, for some of those sorts of people too, like those community VIPs, was a little bit of a bummer. Um, so if you like this stuff, you can request it um, over the next two days. If you don't, that's cool. You know, you don't have to, but um, we wanted to make the option open. So um, what I'll do now after I stop presenting is I'll, I'll share the link where you can, over the next day or two, um, just request that badge and ribbon set. 
um, to be to be physically sent to you. Um, so I'll send it in the chat again in just a moment. Um, and then basically when you get to the address, it's just your email address that you enter when it asks for your email address and the password's 3ds 2021. And then you just fill in your info for shipping. And that's, it's as simple as that. Um, so again, just over the next, next two days, if you want it, um, you know, you can, you can request that. So I just wanted to, to give a shout out uh, partially as a thank you just for coming to user groups and caring to be involved with the community. But, you know, also, cause I think we could all agree, like it's kind of a, you know, as silly as it can seem, it's a it's a badge, right? But it's it's a cool thing for I know a lot of people, include myself. So I wanted to to try to do that. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll paste a, that in there. I was digging through my drawer now, trying to find all my past ribbons, but I, mm -hmm. I think they're upstairs. <laughs> yeah. Some people have them. Uh, I, some of you might even do this. Like if you have a. Like a cube at work, I've I, I know I've walked by desks that are just like full, just like lined up or like on a wall or something. But um, but yeah, feel free to check that link out. Yeah, because there's, there's a lot of goofy ones that you get when you actually go. There's like a I know there's a uh, someone named Luke who does a light side and dark side version, which you donate to a charity. There's another one which is beer me, which you just have a beer with someone and he gives you a ribbon. Uh, another <laughs> one, the Bacon Brotherhood. If you take a photo of you and Bacon, you get the Bacon Brotherhood. Uh, ribbon it's just it's all fun and a lot of people try and collect as many ribbons as possible um it, it just makes it a bit fun and it, it creates a bit more community of kind of you know you're a fan of bacon too let's go hang out um <laughs> kind of thing um it's just every, everybody just finds a little niche and their little way of having a bit more fun at world and hopefully this can recreate that yeah a little bit right as much as much as we can but um yeah I'll be curious too to see if like I see any like crude ribbons made, you know, for example, like somebody just like cutting out a piece of paper and adding it to the to the badge, like Bacon Brotherhood, but just like a piece of paper. <laughs> um, but nah, it'll. Uh, sure, it'll sure. No, you, like... You're hosting your you're hosting your community meetups as well, at World. Yeah, so check those out. Um, thanks, thanks for mentioning that. Uh, oh yeah, Kent. Um, so the password, it's it's just this is very you know melling melling greg would probably think this is like pretty pretty bad like this is terrible <laughs> security but <laughs> it's just your email address and then it's the password 3s 2021 <laughs> um but yeah no it's it's a good thing you bring up kirby so um last year we started we made the hive mind meetups um and they were kind of in direct response like i like um, Tom Smith, who a lot of you guys know, I remember I was talking to him at a, it was at a SolidWorks rollout event, um, kind of by us. And he was saying, you know, it's really, it would be really cool if at SolidWorks world, we sort of had like a birds of a feather type event, which essentially, um, some of you just know what that means. But, you know, for those of you who don't, because at first, honestly, when I heard that, I was like, I don't know what that means. Um, so, <laughs> but what that means is basically just like, you know, a space for a dedicated space, a time and time and place for you to, um, you know, talk to people that do what you do. Right. So the magic of, of a, of a networking conference is that you can just go and it's almost like you don't know who you're going to meet within reason. You kind of have an idea of who's going to be going, but like, you'll meet someone, for example, I met someone who at 3d experience role last year who ran like a coding Institute, like for kids. Um, and so it's not directly related to 3D CAD, but they were local to the Nashville area and they just decided to come. Um, but this, what this is, is like very targeted towards a specific type, type of professional. Um, and I, you know, I've learned actually recently, we we're going to have some really cool tech that we're going to be using. Um, I think it's called Icebreaker um, that some of you, if you've done like virtual conferences, like you may have seen or actually used, you know, if you participated in one, but um, essentially, it was the, the Hive Mind meetups will continue to exist. You can register for those today. Um, you know, for example, if you're uh, if you're in, um, you know, let's say if you're a designer or engineer, we have one for designers and engineers, um, where basically we'll structure like sort of like a networking style chat. Um, you know, we'll all get together in the same room. We'll kind of lay out the objectives, same as last year, and then you'll get split up with some questions and talking points to to network about with your smaller groups. Um, you know, we'll have kind of make it interesting. And then when you come back, we'll kind of have a closing, but you know, it kind of sucks. Like we can't see people in person. Yes. But, um, you know, we're trying to make it kind of fun and enjoyable and still give you that experience where you can kind of meet people that again, do what you do. 
Sounds like fun. Yeah, it'll be Sounds cool. Sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, does anybody? I know Toby just said he had to go off for another meeting, but if anyone has any more questions for um, Greg and Melissa, you can fire away. Even questions for Sean um, about Champions Program and that. I did post the link to the Champions Program there. So if you use SolidWorks and you like to share what you do, you can be part of the Champions Program too. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Um, and yeah, thanks for thanks for coming. Cool. I think that's a good place to, to leave it there. Um, let me put my email up quickly. Where did I put it? Sorry, it's pushing way too many buttons. <laughs> there it is. Cool. So like, I'm always looking for some interesting uh, speakers and anyone, if anyone's interested in speaking or anything, you're more than welcome to. Uh, let me know if you have any questions uh, for any of the speakers tonight. I can pass them on as well if you think of them in the middle of the night uh, while you're going down to get a glass of water. Um, email it to me. Uh, I'll pass it on to them. Um, and yeah, I think that's a that's a, it's been a great evening. Thank you very much for everyone for joining. Um, and I uh, hope to see most of you at 3D Experience World. And I should plan my next meeting for soon after that. Um, there should be another virtual one, but I want to try and make them a bit more frequent as possible. But yeah, thank you very much for joining. Thanks, Kirby. Thank you, Kirby, and all the other presenters. Thank you, thank you for everything. No worries. Excellent. Thanks, thank Kirby. You. I don't know if it is good afternoon or good evening to you. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers. Bye. Bye. Have a nice Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.